Hi, this is Pastor John with Faith Presbyterian Church in McDonough, Georgia, uh, here for another Pastor Chat video. And this is actually our third video on the subject of baptism. And in today's video, I want to explore uh, the question of how, the how of baptism. How should baptism be done properly? And to first answer that question, let's go back to uh, Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus actually institutes baptism. And look here, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, on the right side of your screen there. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And right there we have probably the most important first part of how to do baptism properly, and that is baptism must be done in the name of the Trinity. It must be done in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why? Well, Jesus told us to do that. Um, and, and this is important because, you know, there are some uh, different strange Christian sects and religions that that do some odd things in baptism, maybe like baptism of the dead uh, and, and things like that. And there might be other religions, of course, too, that have something similar to baptism where they baptize in the name of some some other deity or something like that. Um, all of those would not be valid baptisms, of course. Why? Because baptism must be done in the name of the Father and of Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, now, of course, the other element of baptism that's really important is the water. But it brings up a question of how much water do you need? And uh, to answer that, let me first go to the Westminster Confession of Faith. Westminster Confession, of course, is, is not, um, uh, not scripture. It's just something that myself and, and our church, we would view as a very accurate interpretation of scripture. So we would view it as a very helpful thing for understanding scripture. So West, Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 28, 3, says, Dipping of the person into the water is not necessary, but baptism is rightly administered, by pouring or sprinkling water upon the person. So according to that, there's actually three different ways that you could baptize somebody. You could fully immerse them in water, you could uh, pour water over them, or you could sprinkle water upon them. All three of those would be valid. Now, of course, that understanding of baptism, as some of you have, I'm, are probably aware, puts, puts us at odds <laughs> with some other uh, fellow brothers and sisters in the Christian faith. Um, some of our uh, uh, brothers and sisters that are credo Baptists, not all of them, but some of them, uh, might say that baptism is only valid if someone is actually fully immersed in the water. Now, why would they say that? Well, they would say that because the, in their view, the word, the Greek word for baptism, baptizo, is only ever means immerse. Like the, the definition of baptizo is only ever immerse. Well, is that true? Uh, unfortunately, no, it, it's, it's not true. Um, in fact, uh, let me show you here a bunch of definitions for baptism. These uh, uh, up here at the top here, this is the Greek baptizo written out in the Greek. And then on the right there, it is written in English. It's a transliterated word. And then here's just a bunch of reputable uh, Greek dictionaries. And just look at the definitions. Yes, it means to dip, to sink, but it also means to wash, to purify, right? To dip in underwater, to soak in wine, but also to wash, to purify, right? And you're going to notice that throughout all the definitions. And because in the time of the early church, the use of that Greek word baptizo was, was varied. It mostly meant to immerse, like to sink a ship or something like that. Um, but it also was used very often to mean to cleanse something, to purify something, to wash something, like washing your hands, right? But, but now what about in Scripture itself? In Scripture itself... Do we see the word baptizo used to mean anything other than immerse? We do, actually. And let me uh, give you a few examples of that. Here's the first one. It's Hebrews 9.10. But deal only with food and drink and various washings. Now, if you look down 
over here at the bottom right of the screen. When I hover over these words, it'll show you the Greek at the bottom right in a white box. And if you look there, that is the word baptismos. Um, so, uh, which is the root there is baptizo. So here is a description of the various washings, baptizos, <laughs> okay, um, that are done in the uh, in the Old Testament, the different ceremonial cleansings that are done. And notice that the word is translated here not as immersions, but as washings. Uh, here's, some, here's some other examples. Mark chapter 7, verse 3. Here's Mark describing the Pharisees. He says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, baptizo, and there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing, baptismas, of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. So, so here's Mark describing how the Pharisees, when they would leave the marketplace, they would go and baptize themselves. That's the word Mark uses. Now, does Mark have in view that every time the Pharisees leave the marketplace, they go and find a vat of water and fully immerse themselves. I highly doubt that. I mean, that's ridiculous. And even more ridiculous is the idea that every time they're going to go eat, they take their dining couch, this wooden couch with cushions, and they fully immerse it in water before that. No, that, that's not. They're, obviously, they're they're either sprinkling it clean like in a ceremonial way or they're washing it with water or, or something like that. Uh, and then here's another uh, funny example as well. Luke 11, verse 38. Uh, the Pharisee was astonished to see that he, talking about Jesus, did not first wash, baptizo, before dinner. So here's, here's, here's another example, right? Uh, is Luke saying that this Pharisee was surprised that before dinner, Jesus didn't go outside and find a river and take a full-on bath before coming to dinner. No, he was surprised that Jesus before dinner didn't wash his hands, right? Uh, so right there, do, does baptizo always mean immerse? No, even in the Bible, it doesn't always mean immerse. That's, that's just simply not true. Um, now, some people will claim that Jesus himself, when he was baptized, he was fully immersed, and therefore we ought to be fully immersed. Here's the problem with that. When you actually look at Jesus' baptism in the Gospels, it doesn't say necessarily that he was fully immersed. Uh, let, let, me, let me show you here. This is Matthew uh, 3.16. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. So now what do we actually know about Jesus' baptism? We know it was done by John the Baptist. We know it was done in the river. But do we know that Jesus was actually fully immersed? No. Now you can read, immediately he went up from the water, as saying that Jesus was fully immersed in the water, and then he come, came up out of the water. But you could also very well read that, as Jesus went down into the water, John the Baptist baptized him. Maybe he sprinkled him. Maybe he poured water on him. Maybe he immersed him. And then Jesus immediately came up out of the river, came up out of the water, up onto the shore. And then the Spirit of God descended on him. Either interpretation works here. Um, so we can't for sure say that Jesus was, was fully immersed. Um, there's also some historical evidence as well uh, that, you know, baptism in the early church was not always done uh, through immersion. Uh, I mean, if you just think of the geography of where all these things take place, uh, where the early church was at in the arid Middle East, you know, water, the, that amount of water might not have always been available uh, for people. Um, you know, sometimes rivers ran dry. And, and I, I find it hard to imagine that in the early church, if there was a, a person or a group of people or a family or some children that needed to be baptized and, and the, you know, the, it was a dry season and the river was really low and you couldn't actually physically like completely cover them. I find it hard to imagine that the church would have been like, nope, can't do it today. 
you know, come back next week, <laughs> come back next season. You know, I, I, I don't think that's what would have happened. I think they would have gotten some water, a cup of water and poured it over the head and that would have been fine. Um, and, and also <laughs> one more, one more example. This is anecdotal. Um, the earliest known picture of Jesus's baptism comes from like, I think it's like the middle of the second century. And it seems to depict John the Baptist with his hand over Jesus' head, pouring water over Jesus' head. Now, that's anecdotal. That's not scripture. That's just a picture. But it's interesting that the early church seems to have depicted Jesus' baptism in that way. That, that's all that is. But here's the deal. Um, you know, if we're going to insist that baptism must be done through immersion, I, personally, I think we're just losing sight of what the point of baptism is. Remember what baptism is. We've said this in previous videos now. Baptism is a sign. And what is that sign pointing to? It is pointing to the work of Jesus on the cross. It's pointing to how the blood of Jesus can wash away my sins, cleanse me of my sins, right? Uh, in fact, you know, let's let's look at Hebrews chapter nine real quick, and uh, not nine, but ten, verse nineteen. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain that is through His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So when we talk about what Jesus has done for us on the cross through his blood, what has he done? He's sprinkled clean our hearts. He's washed us with pure water. That's what he has done. And that's what baptism is pointing to. Um, so the idea that baptism must be all about the immersion I think is really misguided. Um, so bottom line, I, I would just say this. It, it, it's very odd, in my opinion, to say that baptism is, should only be done by immersion because that's the main definition of the word. And I think that's odd because imagine if we started doing that with other words in the Bible. Like take the word repentance, for example. In, in the Greek, repentance is the word metanoia. Now, metanoia literally means, the, the main and only definition of metanoia is to change one's mind. We translate that as, as repentance, but it, it means to change one's mind. Now, let me ask you, is that all repentance is? Is repentance in the Bible only changing my mind about something? Does it not involve my behavior and my heart at all? No. Right? Like if we were to do a survey of, of repentance throughout the scriptures, we would see very quickly that, yeah, that's the word for repentance. But repentance is described as changing my behavior, turning away from my sin. Yes, changing my mind, but also my heart being changed. Paul describes repentance in Romans as putting my sin to death. Right? So we cannot let just the main definition of a word dictate our practice in the church. Um, so I, I think that's important. Now, before I end the video, I do want to make a confession, okay? I actually love the imagery of immersion. I, I really do. I mean, when if you see a baptism and you see someone getting lowered into the water and then coming up out of the water, I always think of we are buried with Jesus in his death and risen to walk in newness of life. I think it's a beautiful picture. I personally was baptized through full immersion, and I'm glad I was. But the question here is, is that the only valid way to baptize someone? And I think as we look at the scriptures and we look at the history of the early church and everything, I, I think what we see very clearly is, no, no, no it's not. You can, you can be baptized by being fully immersed. You can be baptized by someone pouring water over your head. You can be baptized by someone sprinkling water on you as well. All three of those, I think, find a valid place in, in scripture. 
Uh, and so I hope I hope that was helpful uh, to you. Uh, feel free to share these videos and comment uh, on them and uh, message me too uh, if you uh, have any other topics that you'd like to see me do a little pastor chat about. But I will see you for our next and hopefully final video on baptism where we discuss how often should baptism be done. But until then, God bless.